Hi, I'm Chris. Hi, I'm Robert, and we're the Film Flamers, a monthly podcast devoted to all things horror. Well, horror and film, at least. And horror adjacent. Horror adjacent. Yes. With a little sprinkle of glitter thrown in. <laughs> Today we're talking about Suspiria, Dario Argento's classic from 1977, getting our conversation in a couple months before the remake comes out. Suspiria is a 1977 Italian supernatural horror film directed by Dario Argento and is partially based on Thomas de Quincey's 1845 essay Suspiria de Profundis, or Sighs from the Depths, specifically the story of Lavana and Our Ladies of Sorrow. The film is actually the first in a trilogy uh, that Argento refers to as the Three Mothers, which also, of course, comprises Inferno from 1980 and The Mother of Tears in uh, 2007. Mm-hmm. Suspiria's become one of Argento's most successful feature films, though, receiving a lot of critical acclaim for its visual and stylistic flair, its use of vibrant colors, and its score by the progressive rock band Goblin. Right. Suspiria in Spanish and Latin translates to sigh, exhale, or breathlessness, depending on the usage. And that's how they determine their witches in these movies, too. So in this first film, you don't know it yet because there's a lot of plot explanation in the movies after it, but the audience doesn't know that. In this one, it is the mother of sighs. And Inferno, what's the mother? It's the mother of darkness. Mother of darkness. Wow, that's heavy. And then the final one is the mother of the mother of tears. tears. Collectively, they're the mothers of sorrow. Ooh. Yeah, that brings us back to that uh, story that it's loosely based on Lavana and Our Ladies of Sorrow. Right. The film most notably stars Jessica Harper as the American ballet student and Joan Bennett as Madame Blanc in her final film role. Who played Instructor Tanner? You know, I can't say her name because it's very Italian, but in her heyday, she was supposed to be sort of like the next Garbo coming to America from Europe, and she just never quite made it out of Italy. I love Garbo. Yeah, I mean, every gay man does. Suspiria is considered a giallo horror film. Uh, Giallo, at least from an international perspective, is a specific genre of Italian horror films that focuses on mystery elements and often contains slasher, crime fiction, psychological thriller, psychological horror, sexploitation, and less frequently, supernatural horror, like this film. That's right. Argento got his start making these kinds of mystery movies, a la Hitchcock in the United States. Um, the movies were mostly about unseen assailants attacking, attacking people through Europe, uh, with stylized violence, and there were never things like ghosts, demons, or witches. As a genre, it's been considered to be a predecessor to, or at least a significant influence on, the American slasher film genre. The word giallo is actually Italian for yellow. The term derives from a series of cheap paperback mystery novels that actually had yellow covers that were popular in post-fascist Italy. In fact, a lot of these uh, gialli books that came out were actually made into movies. Argento's movies, original work, came from some of these books. And I think some of the directors that he favored a lot, like Mario Bava from Italy, did the exact same thing. He's oftentimes referred to as the Italian Hitchcock. Now, this is a movie that I have seen many times throughout my life. I think I saw it first when I was 11, and I know that this was your first viewing of the movie. Yeah, totally. So, uh, without further ado, this is Suspiria. Roses are red, violets are blue, but the iris is the flower that will mean the end of... You can hide from Suspiria. Suspiria. But you cannot escape. Suspiria. The only thing more terrifying than the last 12 minutes of Suspiria are the first 92. The film opens as Susie Banyan, played by Jessica Harper, a ballet student from New York, arrives at an airport in Germany on her way to the famous, or soon-to-be-infamous, Tanzdance Academy on a dark and stormy night. 
Susie takes a taxi to the academy, but before she can get to the door, she notices another girl there, Pat, who's leaving, but she's whispering and kind of trying to communicate with someone inside the door that we can't see. She runs away before she can really interact with the girl, but Susie goes to the door and tries to get in and is not let in. Even though she says she's supposed to be there, a mysterious voice over the intercom tells her that she's not welcome. Susie gets back into the taxi and goes to stay the night, presumably at a hotel. On her way, she sees Pat running through the woods. The film switches to Pat's point of view at this point as she makes her way to her friend's fancy apartment building, telling her friend that she's, she's discovered some sort of dark, horrible secret, but she's not really making much sense. So she locks herself in the bathroom in order to just cope and be alone. However, she can sense that something's after her. She can sense that something's watching her. And lo and behold, a shadowy figure watches her through the window, reaches out, and grabs her. Pat's friend, hearing frantic screams and an obvious attack, goes and tries to get the attention of any neighbor she can for help. However, no one's answering their doors. Meanwhile, Pat's been savagely attacked, stabbed multiple times in the chest, had a rope tied around her neck, and pushed through the sunroof over the main apartment building's lobby. As Pat falls through the ceiling, stabbed and hung, glass and metalwork fall on her friend just as she passes through trying to get help. Both of them, obviously, are dead. The next morning, Susie returns to the Academy and is introduced to Vice Directress Madame Blanc, played by Joan Bennett, and Miss Tanner, an instructor. She also meets two students, Sarah and Olga. When Madame Blanc tells Susie that a room's been prepared for her at the dormitory, Susie fires back that she's already got plans to live with Olga at her apartment. But Madame Blanc is obviously displeased with this idea, but the conversation ends there. Later during Susie's first ballet lesson at the academy, she starts to lose energy and eventually faints. She later wakes up to find that she's been moved into a dormitory on campus where doctors tell her that she has to be medicated and stay at the dormitory in order to recoup. Susie's now in close proximity to Sarah at the dorms who she met earlier with Olga, and the two become pretty fast friends. That evening, as the students prepare for dinner, maggots start falling from the ceiling en masse. They're later told that this was because there was spoiled food being stored in the attic. Due to this, the students are told that they can spend the night in the main practice hall along with the instructors while the dorms are being cleaned along with the attic. That night, as Susie and Sarah are lying in bed in the practice hall with everyone else, Sarah hears a distinctive whistling snore that she identifies from past experience as the school's mysterious directress who is actually not due to return at the academy for a couple of weeks. While Sarah's trying to explain this to Susie, Susie can't seem to stay awake and just passes out. The next day, Miss Tanner, the instructor, fires the school's blind piano player, Daniel, after his guide dog supposedly bit the creepy academy custodian's even creepier son. That night, Daniel's walking through a plaza and senses something following or something unnerving. The dog senses it too. As they're waiting to see what's happening, the dog suddenly changes and rips Daniel's throat out. Back at the academy, Susie and Sarah discuss all the strange happenings and deaths. Susie recalls that she heard Pat say something like Iris and Secret as she was leaving the academy that first stormy night. Sarah tells Susie that she's heard footsteps nightly from multiple sources that seem to all lead to the same place within the academy. She's suspicious of the instructors and want to know what they're doing after hours every night. As Sarah's explaining this to Susie, yet again, Susie gets way too tired and just falls asleep before she can pay too much attention or follow the conversation. After Susie falls asleep, Sarah becomes paranoid that something's trying to get her. She can hear those same footsteps and notices something trying to check her room. She leaves in a panic and tries to follow the footsteps, but is followed and chased by something unseen. After trying to escape it in the attic, she falls into razor wire and is caught by the unseen force who then slits her throat. The next morning, Madame Blanc and Miss Tanner tell Susie that Sarah abruptly left the academy during the night, which, of course, Susie doesn't really quite believe. Suspicious, Susie goes into town to visit one of Sarah's acquaintances, psychologist Frank Mandel, who explains that the Academy was actually founded by Helena Marcos, an immigrant from Greece and known to be a cruel woman. She was also suspected to be a witch, or even the queen of an entire coven of witches. Mandel's colleague, Professor Milius, tells Susie that a coven can't survive without their queen. When Susie gets back to the Academy, all the other students have left to see a performance by the Bolshoi Ballet. After disposing of her food and wine, which she of course now suspects to have been drugged this whole time to keep her drowsy, she hears the same footsteps that Sarah had mentioned before she died. Susie follows the footsteps to Madame Blanc's office, where the footsteps have all seemed to stop. She notices the pattern on the walls, which are floral. One of the irises on the walls can turn and reveals a hidden passage. This must be what those two words meant that Pat said at the beginning when she met her on that stormy night. Iris and secret. 
Down the secret passage, Susie observes Madame Blanc, Miss Tanner, and the staff performing a ritual and plotting her death. Susie turns to discover Sarah's mutilated corpse nailed to a coffin. Panicked, she runs into another room where she hears a distinctive whistling snore and realizes that she just stumbled in on the Academy Director's room and the Queen of the Witch's Coven, Helena Marcos, who she just accidentally awakened. Helena Marcos immediately becomes aware of the situation and becomes invisible and orders Sarah's corpse to kill Susie. But Susie can hear and even faintly see Helena and in a panic she stabs her in the throat with a knife, killing her. Sarah's body immediately falls to the floor and the rest of the coven starts asphyxiating without their queen. Susie escapes just as the academy collapses in flames. Suspiria was nominated for two Saturn Awards, Best Supporting Actress for Joan Bennett in 1978 and Best DVD Classic Film Release in 2002. It's become a cult classic and is recognized as an influential film in the horror genre. Yeah, that's right. It's ranked a lot on many lists. I know that Entertainment Weekly ranked it at like 18 out of like 25 scariest movies of all time. And The Village Voice ranked it 100 out of 100 of the most influential films of the 20th century. And, I mean, even just being on that list is prestigious, even at 100. Yeah, uh, the film's actually noted for being an exemplar of Euro horror, as uh, quoted from European Nightmares, horror cinema in Europe since 1945. Um, Adam Smith of Empire Magazine awarded the film a perfect score of 5 out of 5. Um, they also ranked Suspiria 312 on their list of 500 greatest films ever, like all films encompassing total. Whoa. Uh, and number 45 on the list of 100 best films of world cinema. Uh, all Movie called it one of the most striking assaults on the senses ever to be committed to celluloid. A poll of critics on Total Film ranked it number 3 on its list of 50 greatest horror films ever. And one of the film's sequences was ranked number 24 on Bravo's The 100 Scariest Movie Moments program. And finally, IGN ranked it number 20 on their list of the 25 best horror films. So it's been everywhere on these lists. If there's a list, it is on it. Yes. I'd like to talk about the music of this film for a second. The Italian prog rock band Goblin composed most of the film's score in collaboration with actually with Argento himself. Goblin had previously scored uh, Argento's earlier film Deep Red as well as several subsequent films following Suspiria. But like Ennio Morricone's compositions for like Sergio Leone for the Italian Spaghetti Westerns, Goblin's score for Suspiria was created before the film was shot. So they actually played it on set to scare the shit out of the cast while they were actually filming the scenes. Right, that's right. I mean, I know that uh, Jessica Harper has said that when she read the script, they asked her, like, you know, how could you be in a movie like this? And she said, well, the script was so intact that she really didn't know what it was going to look like. She had to trust Dario's version of it or his vision. And hearing these things on set sort of got her in the mood, and it helped her, you know, act in a way that would look great on film. Plus, a lot of people that she was working with were speaking Italian at her anyway. And, yeah, and basically the whole thing yeah. was overdubbed. And it was overdubbed in English. And so, I mean, like, this, this music is completely iconic. You can't think of a horror movie like this, and or you can't talk about Suspiria and not talk about the music at all. It just really creates the atmosphere in this movie. Yeah, it's, it's so good. I mean, it starts with the credits. The main thing oh, yeah. starts with the credits, and you instantly know. There is some soundtrack spoilers, though, here, because every once in a while you'll hear... Wish! <laughs> right in the middle of the music. And there's really no indication in the film that this is witchcraft until kind of near the end. Well, the first time I saw this movie, it was like 11 or 12, and I had rented a VHS copy, and all I knew that it was supposed to be very, very violent and pretty scary. And so I was excited to watch it, and I had no idea it was about witches. Mm -hmm. And then within the first, you know little bit of the soundtrack and it screams witch i was like well i guess this movie's about witches so i mean spoiler alert goblin the the soundtrack's actually been reused in multiple hong kong films of all things including uh yen wook ping's martial arts film dance of the drunk mantis in 1979 and <laughs> sue hark's horror comedy we're going to eat you in 1980 <laughs> The main title theme, which is the theme they actually reused throughout the film multiple times, um, was actually named one of the best songs released between 1977 and 1979 in the book The Pitchfork 500, Our Guide to the Greatest Songs from Punk to the Present, compiled by influential music website Pitchfork. It has been sampled many, many times. I mean, but can you even call it a song? I can't imagine that people were, like, turning on the radio to listen to this, right? On first watch of this movie, it almost just sounds like noise. Right. Yeah. But that sort of helps the the viewer 
get into this world where we have no idea what's going on. Like we don't we don't normally hear music like this and we don't normally see things on screen like Suspiria is. And it really just creates an atmosphere. I read that someone said that watching a good copy of Suspiria on a big screen with the volume turned way up is almost a sensual experience. <laughs> Well, I could agree with that. I mean, I actually listened to the soundtrack um, before I watched the film because I'm just a huge film score buff and I've heard so many things about it and I've just never gotten around to listening to it. Especially since it's, it's not a traditional score. It's done by a band. And this was a little bit more common, uh, of course, back in the 70s and 80s. But, you know, honestly, I didn't expect it to be this actually cinematic. Of course, there is some spoken word, which, which, but uh, there's also some mumbling and, and things in the background, which is always fun for me going back and watching an older film that I hadn't seen before and seeing all these other films I like that were obviously influenced by it. Clearly. And it's just like, it's just really surprising and it's fun to see. I, I guess some people could be disappointed by that. Oh, I thought this film was more original than that. But everything's influenced by everything else. Nothing is completely 100% original. Well, no. I mean, every person in Hollywood or even, obviously, in Italy can see movies. And we, this is an experience that we all share globally. And, I mean, influence comes from that. Uh, oftentimes, when I was studying like literature in, in high school and college, Everything could be boiled down to like six basic plot lines. So mm -hmm. I mean, everything is shared. Yeah, and uh, having to do with this uh, the score, uh, I feel like there's there's echoes of it and other scores that I've I've listened to for decades or at least the last you know couple of years. And one of those is um, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Another one is The Witch, and uh, specifically points where there's kind of spoken word and mumbling in the background and, and there's kind of an atmospheric part that kind of uses that like almost like a chanting. Another movie that's influenced uh, by it, I would say, is Hans Zimmer's score for The Ring. And there's actually like, I, I, I was really surprised, I was like, where have I heard this before? It sounds so familiar, the main theme from Suspiria. And I, I just remembered The Ring, something in The Ring. And so I actually went back and listened to Hans Zimmer's score and here, I'll just, I'll just show you. This is an excerpt from Suspiria. And this is an excerpt from Hans Zimmer's score from The Ring. I mean, they sound incredibly similar, and I I wish that I had picked up on that sort of thing, having seen The Ring as many times as I have, and seen Suspiria as many times as I have. But, you know, the the score to Suspiria is so jarring all the time, and I just remember The Ring, like, being so soothing. And Yeah, it's basically yeah. the same main theme right. worked into one of The Ring's themes um, that that's ongoing through the film, and even the sequel, and it's basically just a down-tempo version. If only the ring score was like VHS tape instead of which. I mean, <laughs> VHS tape. Yeah, soundtrack spoilers. Speaking of things that are calling back or influence, I want to talk a little bit about Kubrick and Hitchcock and Argento. So Argento was obviously, or even said to be, uh, a huge fan of Hitchcock, and that can kind of we can kind of see that in this film with like bizarre architecture. Like a little bit of that Escher, hence she's she's trying to get to Escher Strasse where the Academy is, and uh, there's actually hints of MC Escher all over the place. But that's kind of a Hitchcock thing. And then there's also just like the way the shots are done, the way the camera is, like single point perspective, a lot of symmetry, vibrant colors. A lot of this just is so reminiscent of Kubrick's work. And before that, I think his two previous um, films for that were Clockwork Orange and 2001: A Space Odyssey. And what's interesting is I thought some of the interior scenes, especially at like Pat's friend's apartment at the beginning of the film, that was like so super symmetry and and all of the vibrant colors and everything. I was like, this looks like The Shining, like well, this interior interior scenes. And but The Shining didn't come out until four years later after Suspiria. So it was like this repetitive cycle of influencing each other. And now with the uh, the remake, we're hearing a buzz come out, and there's people actually coming out of this film of the remake of Suspiria saying. 
This is the closest thing to Kubrick we've seen in decades. And so this cycle is repeating itself, and I think that's awesome. Well, I mean, directors do, like we already said, like share a lot of influence amongst each other. And Dario's work early on in his career was crime thrillers, and that's what Hitchcock made. But Hitchcock made his movies in such a way that his camera work did amazing things that people couldn't even think of at the time. And just building on from that, Argento did similar things. He did new things with the camera that people hadn't seen before. Yeah, and he's a little bit freer with his camera than Kubrick would be. So it's almost like Argento is an amalgam between Hitchcock and Kubrick, which is not a bad place to be. No, I completely agree. And when you're talking about like similarities between The Shining and, and uh, Suspiria, just like the basic like patterns of stained glass almost mirror the carpet and the floor of the overlook of The Shining. I mean, just similar patterns all over the place. And it's just amazing to see. Yeah, and I don't know how much that has to do with just the, the, the being influenced by each other or, you know, 70s. Well, <laughs> I mean, everyone had bed carpet in the 70s, but my God, you have to create that pattern from yeah. The Shining. I grew up with lime green carpet. <laughs> I prefer wood floors. If you ask anybody, the one thing they remember is about Suspiria, it's going to be color period. Yeah, it's all about, excuse the plot, it's all about the colors, the music, and the gore. Well, he's trying to create a fever dream. And the best way that he can do that is by shading color on everything and making it seem completely otherworldly while having this, you know, crazy soundtrack in the background and a plot that almost makes no sense. You just have to sort of give into it and go along with it. I know a reviewer said that it was a movie that only made sense to the eye. It you know, it has nothing to do with your brain. It's how you feel when you're watching it. Yeah, like the lurid colors and the strange set create an unsettling atmosphere that gets under your skin long before a murder happens. Well, and that's what he was trying to do anyway. Argento wanted to make a movie that was like a fairy tale. He was very influenced by fairy tales and specifically early Disney films like Snow White. Um, his wife at the time... Uh, co-wrote the screenplay with him and she was also heavily influenced by things like Hansel and Gretel and I've heard some like actual occurrences that happened in her life or stories that her grandmother had told her and so this movie itself is sort of created by three different auteurs that make the movie what it is Dario Argento's vision cinematically his wife's screenplay which he helped you know write and then Goblin score just create a movie that is unlike anything you've ever seen and it's almost not even called a movie. Yeah. And there's a little bit of that trope we discussed last episode with Copycat uh, called Nothing is Scarier. And that kind of goes back into that if nothing's happening, but you're right in the atmosphere and you can feel it. You can feel it creeping up on you. And so the Nothing is Scarier trope is actually mirrored actually in the first, uh, almost the first murder with you know, nothing is scarier than darkness or nothing is scarier than nothing with the darkness gazes back, which is the first murder where you see the eyes just staring back at her and you have no idea what's going on. You have no idea what's after. You have no idea what the mystery is. Well, I just can't understand if Susie gets to the, the dance academy and it's pouring rain outside and she's trying to get in and she sees someone like talking to herself and then fleeing out into the rain and... You know, she leaves and she sees the same person running through the woods, right? Mm -hmm. First of all, I don't understand why in the fact she can go back to that dance academy anyway. Well, what's interesting to me about that specifically, she sees Pat later. She's leaving in the taxi and going back to like a hotel, presumably, or whatever. Right. Right, for that night before she goes back the next morning. But she sees Pat. She saw Pat at the door. And then she sees her later running through the woods. And she's recalling all of this stuff to a detective. And later on, she remembers more. Never mentions again that she saw her running through the woods. Right Never mentions it once. And it was a really interesting, visually, it was a really interesting scene. So oh, it was it like, great. it was like Argento made a film visually that's separate from the script. Well, because again, I mean, it's just like I said, it's like a dream too. I mean, she gets to this, she gets there and it's pouring down rain. She has no idea what's going on. She's in a really strange environment, which a lot of giallo films have too. It puts somebody in a place where they're not supposed to be because that creates fear for them and the audience. And you're seeing someone run through the woods in the rain. It just looks incredibly disconcerting. Yeah. And I mean, it's hard for anyone to process. And Pat's death, I think, is probably the most horrific in the entire movie and it's the very first one 
Right. I mean, you would think that a lot of horror movies would build up to something like that. What's that movie where everyone that was supposed to die in an airplane is being killed by death? Oh, Final Destination? Final Destination. Kind of reminded me of Final Destination. It's like these witches put something into motion and it takes care of itself. And we see that later, again, of course, with the uh, piano player who got fired for biting the uh, custodian's... Or a custodian's so the little boy. Yeah, right? the custodian's little boy's hand or whatever, the creepy child, which is, you know... Well, that happens. I think, I mean, like, that's a trope in horror movies where, like, people who get way too close to the actual knowledge of things get killed. Yeah, he had the evil detecting dog, which is another trope, right? Uh, of course... And Pat clearly knew what was going on. It was done with a, with a twist, though, because... The dog and him are, like, looking around. They think something's wrong, like, later that night after he gets fired. And he's looking around. He's a big open space, and there's nothing there. But there's all this atmosphere. You think, like, the statues are coming alive and going to kill him, or there's birds or something. It ends up being the dog that instantly just changes and bites his throat out. Well, I mean, that man was blind. He wasn't seeing anything. So it was like fate was searching for a way to kill him. It had no other way, and so just used the dog that was standing right next to him. Well, and there was clearly something in that plaza anyway. I mean, like, swooped down to get them, right? Well, I thought so. I thought it was one of the statues or whatever, but it ended up being the dog, so it kind of caught me by surprise on my first watch. And what's interesting is, like, to me, there's kind of a subversion because the dog was the one that was kind of detecting, like, like, remember, like, evil detecting dog trope where it can sense evil. And it sensed evil in that stupid little child. Oh, I'm sure. And, and that, that child, child looked terrible anyway, walking around with that little page boy haircut. And it always had this look of, I don't even know, like he was just bewildered. Maybe he had just never seen a witch before well, or something. There but. was something else about that child, and I don't know what it was, but he was in the coven. And ended up, he or she. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he died in that room with her ass. Yeah, you didn't need to be a grown-ass woman to be on that coven. Obviously, you could be. There was uh, there was another man too in it, right? Oh yeah, oh, it was the uh, the, it was the, the, the butler, yeah. the guy who had the brand new teeth. Isn't he handsome with his smile? Oh, gross. Uh, that first murder, though, when Pat gets to her friend's apartment, and I mean, like she she could really set the story for us, but she doesn't. She she's reluctant to tell her friend what's going on, and she just wants to get far away as possible. But she's gonna stay the night. Which is probably her first mistake anyway. If you're already running through the woods in the middle of the rain, just keep on going until you're well out of Germany. <laughs> and uh, But she stops for the night. Well, she's running in heels, too, which I think is great. Because she's, like, running on that cobbled street. And I was just like, I would have broke my ankle. Um, so she gets there, and she's looking out the window and sees those eyes. And this first attack that we see in this movie is completely ultraviolet. I mean... It, she stabbed so many times. You see the beating heart. You see yeah. her beating heart. She's cut. Her she's cut open, and you see the knife actually plunge into her beating heart. And that's just not something that you see very often in horror movies, even the most violent of horror movies. And as stylized as this is, I mean, it's got to be a little off-putting for people who saw it for the first time. Yeah, I think the other horrific, uh, maybe. The mind, like, makes it more horrific than it actually was on screen. But with Susie's roommate and friends, Sarah's death, because she hears those footsteps, she wants to count the steps and find out where they are. There, she's, She feels like something's descending upon her. And right, she is. So she leaves. She tries to follow. She ends up finding, like, there's something after her. She goes up into the attic or whatever. And there is something after her. She tries to escape. She falls into this, like, razor wire, or what's supposed to be razor wire. And, of course, on Blu-ray, it's just a bunch of, like, metal hoops. <laughs> the actress actually later complained that... While it wasn't sharp and it was all fake, it still pinched her skin and left her, like, with marks all over. <laughs> but it's like supposed that. to be, like, razor wire. She's not bleeding or anything from it or whatever. And then, like, I'm watching this with my friend Diane, and she says, When Slinky's attack! <laughs> <laughs> and I was just, I lost it. I couldn't, like, take it seriously from there. But then she's, of course, she escapes that, and then she's just, like, someone slits her throat on the way out. I mean, I would say a Slinky killer. And it's just like, <laughs> I let it walk down the stairs way too long. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, comparatively, that death is not near as bad as being stabbed into your beating heart, you know? And even Pat's friend who died by all the falling glass. Yeah, that was horrible. It's like, why did she have to die? She was, like, right below. The thing is that I identify with that woman so much is because in a situation like that, I would act just the same way. I'm not the kind of person who can calmly call 911 and be like, someone's attacking me. I'd be like, there's a murderer! Oh my god! And I'm also the same person who would look up at falling glass and get cut with it. (laughs) So... 
Yeah, I actually, I, re- I just wish there was like a split screen that could have followed the other girl, like <laughs> screaming down the hallways, jumping on the little doors. By the time like all the attacks happened, she's all the way down on like the bottom floor because apparently there were like 10 floors up at least. Well, she could have saved her herself because nobody was opening a door. Yeah. <laughs> so she's down there and she's like running through and she happens to be right below where she crashes through the sunroof or the glass or whatever and all kills her. That's what you call kismet. <laughs> Uh, speaking of, uh, earlier we referred to, uh, the giallo horror as kind of a predecessor to the American slasher genre, and I'd like to ask you if you thought that Susie was, is the, might be, the original, or one of the original, final girls. I think that Susie is very close to being, I mean, I don't know if she's the original final girl, because I think a lot of people think that Laurie Strode from Halloween is, and I'm not quite sure where this falls. Well, Laurie Strode from Halloween was 1978, right? A full year after this came out. Well, then, yeah, I think that... I mean, so Susie in this movie is completely... She's supposed to be innocent and very nice. Yeah, I think they happen around the same time, but I feel like it's too close for that to really have, like, copied one another or something, because it's, like, the responsible, studious brunette who outwits the bad guys, right? But it's too... They're too close. 1977, 1978, I don't think Carpenter would have copied Argento in that way that soon. No, but both Argento and Carpenter could have copied Black Christmas, which came out way before it. And they had their own final girl. And it was a slasher movie. So, I mean, everyone copies each other. It takes influence from each other. And in the whole scheme of things, Susie is a final girl. And I think that she's ultimately probably one of the best. She gets through this entire movie on her own. And was kind of a dry wit, too. Yeah, I mean, she, she goes into something not knowing any of the story and she doesn't need men to get through this she's in a school with mostly girls and she gets a little advice from guys throughout the movie but she's a smart enough woman to survive this entire thing to figure out what's going on and how to you know kill the entire coven by the end of it and she does all this without compromising any of her naivety wholesomeness or anything like that. She's the same person that she was when she first arrived to the Academy. And Maybe she, a little drugged. And she really hands Helena Marcos's kind of ass to her. I mean, it's almost like a, a curb stomp battle at the end, where it's just like the battle is like surprisingly easy. It takes like five seconds for her to realize where Marcos is and to stab her in the throat and end the whole no, thing. That's because Marcos was invisible. She could have been moving all around that room, but she's just sitting there saying like, oh, you want to kill the hell in my house? And I mean, just like, of course, <laughs> you're going to sit there and like taunt somebody. They're going to stab you in the fucking neck. Well, you can hear. Yeah, she could hear you. Right. And she can and you, she can see your outlines like you're going to get stabbed. But um, of course, it helps that it was raining and there was lightning and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, and of course you can you can see uh, you you find out that she's a load bearing boss. You know when she dies, the building collapses. <laughs> the entire academy it was yeah. a pretty building too. Yeah. Uh-huh. Her <laughs> her and her Vader breath. <laughs> I can't even do it because it hurts my throat. No one can do it. <laughs> Only Helen Mark. That was like five synthesizers it. doing her stories. <laughs> there was a separate Goblin score. <laughs> <laughs> Did you notice though how everyone that died? was wearing white. Maybe to show the blood better, it was a stylistic decision, but it was basically the the trope white shirt of death. I think it has to be because, I mean, Argento is so big on color in this movie and especially the blood. I mean, the blood is so red and thick like paint and it would just look so much better on something that's crisp and white. Yeah, I, and part of me was like, oh, this is old. They didn't know what blood looked like or they didn't care. You know, no, it was a stylistic decision. It was a stylistic decision. choice. He made these choices. This yeah. man made this movie. He wanted it to be bright red. Right. Yeah. And of course, uh, Pat, her friend, and Sarah all wear white as they're brutally murdered. Well, I guess they've learned a lesson. I mean, A... Stay out of Germany in the rain and put on some colors. So originally the idea, or Dario Argento's idea with this film, was to make all of the girls 12 years old. Oh, God. Because that would have been more like realistic for a ballet, like you're going to the ballet, this famous ballet academy. But they were like, no, with this much horror, you know, his own father, who actually helped produce the film, said, no, this is, this is going to make it banned. You're going to get banned. This film is going to be banned if you do 12-year-old girls and then with this much horror and this much gore and have them murdered. It's, no, it's not, no one's going to see it, especially in 1977. Oh, I mean, I probably wouldn't have watched it at that point. But I, that seems like a really, really bad choice. Yeah, well, Dario raised the age limit uh, to 20, uh, but didn't rewrite the script. Hence, uh, the naivete of the characters and the occasional childlike dialogue. 
like the, you know, just all that like teasing and everything at the, at the beginning when she's first meeting the other girls. Wait, are you telling me that girls don't act like that in private? <sighs> they do, but I mean, not that consistently, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how I would know, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. But uh, he also put all the doorknobs at about the same height as the actress's heads, so they'd have to raise their arms in order to open all the doors, just like children. Oh. Yeah. Well, I guess that sort of fits the theme, too. If you're making a movie that's supposed to be based on um, a fairy tale, and if you want to talk about fairy tales, even like Alice in Wonderland, and she was, you know, she was a, you know, a young teen... But Susie's coming into a place that's sort of like Wonderland. And Alice grew and shrunk, you know, by whatever she ate. And it's sort of similar. You never know what you're going to get when you open up the door that's in front of you. Yeah, and it's almost like an incidental motif into that as far as just that whole fairy tale motif, which we see again and again and again with, you know, the innocent girl and the malevolent older women who are jealous or conniving or something like that and that's that's like kind of a recurring motif in these fairy tales right especially in snow white uh and the seven dwarves which actually uh, argento had cinematographer luciana tavoli watch snow white and seven dwarves from of course the original cartoon from 1937 to have him model the color scheme of that film for this one and i mean they do have lots of like stark reds and yellows and even some of the rooms in the academy are called that i'll meet you in the red room or all the people in this class come to the yellow room and i mean we really see a lot of things play out in these kinds of environments without the kind of overwashing color that argento puts into some of the darker scenes he doesn't need it there's so much sunlight coming in and it's daytime and we're supposed to feel safe in environments like that but even just having these rooms called by color brings out something else in the movie that makes us feel uncomfortable and i think we see that when susie's dancing in one of her first you know practices she's in the yellow room she's been hypnotized in the hallway and we see her just getting close to you know losing her shit and she has to keep going because this woman is making her do it make her dance yeah like we keep mentioning the color the color the color uh, it's actually one of the last stark three-color process movies ever made. In fact, after completing the specialized color work on the production, Technicolor Room dismantled their remaining three-strip equipment. So this is one of the last. That's right. And he shot this movie on a camera that was one of the last cameras capable of making that kind of movie mm -hmm. in Italy. So, I mean, he really just, like, <laughs> got a hold on that one and made the end-all, be-all of Technicolor. Yeah, this, this, the film still looks a bit aged with its lighting and grain and everything else and some of its blur and some shots. But the color contrast is just you don't even see that anymore. No. It's amazing. Well, and, like, I know that... Speaking of director influence and whatnot, there are some, like, even Romero films that came after that, that sort of a splash of color on the characters, and he would put that over the framework of the movie. And, I mean, it just, he really made something in this aspect that people have taken and used a lot. I don't think that people thought about color in that sort of scary way that a horror movie could do. We're used to seeing things, most of Hitchcock's movies, in black and white. And you just can't imagine the kind of colors that are happening in these situations. And then we see an Argento film like this, and we see what color can actually do. And it completely changes the mood and feel of everything. Mm. I would have loved to witness the original audiences. I always like, for older movies, I try and see if there's any kind of recording from test audience or something like that. There's a really interesting recording that I uh, saw on YouTube. Like, someone actually recorded the audio of an audience in 1977 watching Star Wars for the first time. Right. And you can hear the audience just being amazed and, like, hooting and hollering and, like, you know, just <laughs> during the whole, like, end sequence. And then you can hear the kid, like, talking with his mom on the way out, you know, how excited he was to see the movie and how amazing it was. Well, I think that, I mean, I, th that can happen these days, too. I think there's still room in film for us to see things and be completely enamored with it or just taken back by, by what you see. It's not completely lost on us. Like Avatar. Oh, my God. I don't want to fucking talk about Avatar. <laughs> Next. <laughs> uh, did you know the woman playing Helena Marcos was not credited? According to Jessica Harper, though, she was a 90-year-old ex-hooker who director David Argento found on the streets of Rome. I did know this, actually. <laughs> Because you don't you don't really see her that much in the movie, and then you, you like like a, a few glimpses of like how hideous that she actually is, and then when I read that piece of information, I was just like, well, they probably didn't put any fucking makeup on her. I was just <laughs> like, I was like, just come in here and say this. Yeah. 
I still think that she should have been dubbed by a different actress because that was really over the top. You're that trying to like... kill Helena Marcos? <laughs> <laughs> it should have been uh, Piper Laurie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh my god. Do you know what's behind that door? Dirty pillows are behind that door. <laughs> the overacting in this movie is just phenomenal. And I know that it was mostly dubbed after the fact. Yeah, most people... of the overacting is, is dubbed. Right. And so, like, they, they chose to put that in there. But it really, I mean, it makes the movie fun for me. I mean, I can't wait to, like, get to an apartment complex and run up and down screaming about murders. But, uh, Joan Bennett in this movie just brings so much old school Hollywood acting to it and just the way that she delivers her lines and her dub matches up to her face impeccably. Like she knows her lines and she's prepared and she delivers it. The only time I really don't like ADR um, is when their lips aren't moving or they're adding dialogue after the fact in editing. And especially now on Blu-ray HD 4K, you can see distance shots. You can see that their mouths aren't moving and it's just like, really? Well, I mean, I've seen a lot of Italian horror movies in my life, and they're all like that. You sort of just have to, like, either, you know, live with it or get over it. But half the time, too, and especially in movies like Suspiria, when it's trying to create that otherworldly atmosphere, and, like, you're watching a movie, and it sort of matches up to their face, but it's not quite right. It just creates, you know, that sort of dreamlike atmosphere again. So, I mean, maybe Argento wanted to have that kind of atmosphere. I don't know if he really made this movie with an American audience in mind, I know that when the movie came out, they were searching for a distributor, and Fox said that they would distribute it in America, and then Fox watched the movie, and they were ashamed of it. So they created their own, like, subsidiary, like, thing to release this movie. They called it, like, International Classics or something like that, because they didn't want to have their name attached to Suspiria at all. Oh, really? Yeah. But it actually, of all of the Giallo horror films, it is probably the most famous. It is in a sense that, I mean, it's, it's not even really, I mean, a giallo film. It has nothing to do with giallo elements aside from having some sort of unseen murderer. Or and, the, the, and the murderer is not really revealed until the end, and there is all that. It is unique in giallo horror, if I have, especially by having supernatural horror elements. Right. But it's there. And Argento went back to make other more giallo-like films later on, things like Tenebrae and Opera. And his first movies were very much giallo. I think for an American audience these days, we don't think about the you know mystery elements of a giallo film. We just think giallo is an overly gory Italian horror movie. And I mean, he delivered that for sure. Mm -hmm. I don't. I mean, I wish that having seen this movie so many times and knowing that it's about witches, I kind of wish that I would have seen a little bit more witchcraft in the movie. Yeah, it's all kind of uh, kind of in between the lines, right? You can kind of you can kind of tell, you can kind of guess what's happening. Like I did earlier, I just guessed. Well, they're they're making it kind of a force of nature. They're making kind of nature kind of figure itself out to their whims, or whatever they've put out into the ether of what they want to happen makes itself happen. And they do that sort of thing. But then you have a scene where they're chasing Sarah through the academy and she locks herself in a room and they're trying to pick a lock with a little knife between the door when they could just have easily said, like, Aloha Mora and just, like, had it done with. I mean... <laughs> yeah, this the magic in this is a little bit scarier in the fact that it's more subtle and mysterious. Until the end when she says sickness and Susie, like, almost collapses backward after she's reached in there, you know, after she found the irises. You know, they pick and choose when they show their witchcraft. And I understand that makes it scarier but um, having seen subsequent movies in the trilogy they really play up some of the witchcraft that the was my next question because I have not seen Inferno I have not seen Mother of Tears and th th there is like in hindsight having done research on this film it's all in the manual like you you don't really know like the the mother of size and all the significance of her snoring sound and all of that stuff and how the witch is asphyxiated at the end until you understand that she was the mother of size and that's not really explained in this film at all that's that mm -hmm. you only really understand that in, with subsequent films and so i was going to ask how they handle magic how they handle like the explanations of this film and the other movies i think i'm not even quite sure that argento knew he wanted to make a trilogy of movies until he made suspiria and it was well received and then he made inferno 
directly after this is the next movie and they tackle the magical aspect of it completely differently um characters are fully aware that there are three mothers and they have books that tell them exactly who these mothers are and where they came from and each mother is given their own place in a different city and a house to live in that was created for them and destroying the house and destroying the mother you know brings an end to these witches so, I mean, I haven't seen Mother of Tears yet. I just keep hearing that it's really bad, even though it's got his daughter in it, and I love her to death. But, I mean, mm-hmm. Inferno itself is good. It really, I mean, if you think that Suspiria is strange and, like, off the wall, Inferno is, you know, to me, ten times worse than that. It's just completely, elaborately strange. Like, the plot barely makes sense to me and it's just people sort of like checking boxes as to what we have to do right and so like someone goes to new york because that's where the next mother is that they have to destroy but i mean it it continues the storyline it really like pushes the trilogy along and i'm gonna watch the third movie i mean despite how bad it is i mean i like argento's movies and it can't be that bad well i definitely want to see the remake um if nothing else i love tilda swin She's my favorite actor. <laughs> that little boy is so good in everything that she does. I don't. Every time I look at her, I'm horrified. So I know that this movie is going to be great. What? Like, what are you trying to say? Like, I mean that she looks frightening to me. Oh, I love her. I think she's beautiful. I think she's uh, she's she's got an androgynous quality, but in every different movie, she has a different look. You're just like twigs. Did you Did you ever see Snowpiercer? No, I have not. Oh, she's Train? amazing. Yes, yeah. she's amazing in Snowpiercer. She's not. She doesn't look like herself at all. She's got gigantic glasses on. She's got big buck teeth teeth in. Oh my god! Really? And yeah, and she <laughs> speaks completely different. And she's amazing. And it's a completely different cut. Character she's a fantastic movie. actress. I mean, I've I've seen her in movies, and I, I love her work. And I've seen some stills of this movie in the trailer for the remake, and it just looks completely different than Argento's Suspiria. And I was so on the fence about this movie when I heard they were remaking it until I saw the trailer and until I started reading some of this early buzz. And now I've just, I have to see it. Yeah. And I mean, I just have such a fucking hard on for this movie and it's, it's got to be good. It just has to be. I, it's going to be, if, if they say it's the best thing, it's the nearest thing to Kubrick that we've gotten in, in decades, you know, I'm already on board, mm-hmm. you know, outside of Tilda Swinton, outside of you know suspiria itself i need to see this film in that remake though jessica harper appears to be in the film in a secondary role yeah she says i i read an interview recently with her and she had already fin- finished filming her parts of the movie and they asked her specifically if she was playing an older version of her character and she said no that she's playing a more romantic part that she's there as sort of a visual and it sort of like grounds the movie in another way. I'm assuming probably a ghost, but I mean, I can't assume too much until I see the movie. Well, the remake's supposed to be, what did you say, like a full like hour or hour and a half longer yeah, than the original? it's almost an hour and a half longer than the original. So we're really looking forward to the remake, obviously. Of course, and I'm sure that we will let everybody know how we feel about it almost immediately. Yeah, probably as a bonus content. Uh, We've already talked about how directors can be influenced by each other and the movies they've made, but we haven't quite talked about how Suspiria has influenced culture, specifically gay culture. There's a gay American poet, Kevin Killian, and he published his first collection of poems, and it was called the Argento series. And each poem itself uh, takes influence from one of Argento's movies, mostly Suspiria and Tenebrae. But it's all about the plight of gay men during the AIDS pandemic of the 80s and late 70s. And so it's completely influenced our culture in in many ways. Not to mention, stylistically, this movie is like so much color and good costumes and lighting. I mean, it's great. Costumes? You don't think the costumes are good? See, when I think good costumes, I, I'm fairly over the top. I think you know, I mean, like, not the crisp, white, bloody dresses. I or think, whatever, like, Lord like, of the Rings, and I think Legend, and I think, you know, other things. Oh, well, I mean, well, it's not a science fiction movie. I think Tim Curry in a devil suit. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie, too. I think I own that on Blu-ray. Um, a woman, sort of avant-garde writer from the late 80s, wrote a movie called My Mother Demonology. And in it, there is a section of the book that she took almost directly from Suspiria, where maggots are invading girls eating at a table. And for me, that was like one of the worst parts of that movie, because I just cannot stand 
things with no legs and maggots in general. If I see a maggot in real life, I've just like lost it. And yeah. so and it just, turns out there was just guys on the rafters just throwing rice down on the actresses in order to do that. Oh, thank God it wasn't real maggots. Cause I mean, if he's going to like play that, you no know, crazy music in the background. He might as well put some maggots in a hairbrush. Well, or something. they use different things in different scenes. So the close-ups, they did use maggots. But for the falling from the ceiling into the girl's hair, yeah, that was rice. Okay, now it's time for some questions. Is this a horror movie? Definitely, it's definitely a horror movie. Not only does it fit squarely, in my opinion, to the giallo horror, or at least kind of a pinnacle of where it led, uh, and they're still making giallo horror movies. But honestly, this is, I think, kind of a standalone for various reasons that we've already talked about. But it definitely is more than Copycat that we covered last episode, which was kind of Venn diagrammed in, right? This is a horror movie. I think even if you took out some of the like the violent scenes, even if you didn't see a, a beating heart getting stabbed with a knife, or you didn't see some like bright red blood on things, it goes back to things that really scare us, like being in a strange place and being around strange people who don't act the way that you're used to it, and you know having to to live in an environment where someone brings you food that you didn't get to choose. You're just in a place where you have no control over your life whatsoever, and that's just horrifying. Yeah, there's a lot of like almost agoraphobic and claustrophobic feelings in this movie. You're trapped in wide open spaces. You're trapped in the middle of a foreign country. You're trapped in this house. You're trapped eating these meals that you have no control over. There's a lack of control here. Completely. And it definitely makes you feel that way. If there was no gore whatsoever, just on the soundtrack, the colors, the cinematography, the acting alone. I mean, even when she's in a safe environment in this movie, she's walking through an airport and there's no soundtrack whatsoever. The only safe place in the film is that airport. Is the airport. You can't get safer than that. And no one's safe in airports. I mean, my God. Uh, but she's walking and you can see the doors opening and closing, these automatic doors. And every time the doors open and she can see outside and it's pouring down rain and you just hear this score and you have no idea whether you're in a safe place or not in this movie. That was fairly jarring. When I first noticed that and the score was turning off when the doors closed, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's very stark. It's a silence. And it's like, was that a mistake? No. Yeah, Cause it you can hear the intercom in the background, just saying the, the most mundane things of everyday life. And she's looking right outside at what the future holds for her and all of us are terrified and then the it. score leads us into the film right until it says witch <laughs> witch and we all know exactly what it's about <laughs> uh were you scared in this movie no uh no i wasn't um but i also went in having done a lot of research and kind of knowing what it was about i remember seeing, knock that shit off i remember seeing the witch for the first time and alamo draft house uh, always does pre-show, custom pre-show. Mm -hmm. And one of the films they said that was uh, The Witch was inspired by was Suspiria. So I, and it showed some scenes. And so I had already been familiar with the film, and uh, I already kind of knew what it was about. Plus, you know, I love horror movies, partially probably because they don't bother me. You know, they don't, yeah. they don't scare me. Um, there's, there's a few out there that uh, affect me, and those are the ones that are the slow burn. And those are the ones that really have to do with Things in life you just can't escape, you know? I I mean, I like to say that I don't get scared of movies that often, but that's completely untrue. Because when I watch a movie, I tend to try so hard to get lost in it. And really, upon first viewings of movies, like, I, I find myself being scared. And I remember the first time that I saw Suspiria, I wasn't completely horrified by the violence. Because I had, I had seen movies with more realistic violence than that. But they were just... just certain aspects of the movie or the way it made me feel put me on edge and I felt very scared and those maggots really really fucking bothered me the first time I watched this movie well I mean if you think about it then very next year Halloween came out correct and and a lot of people have put Suspiria on these top 100 scary moments and things like that I don't think of any of those that really is particularly scary but back then, there wasn't a huge plethora of uh, like the torture porn, the torture porn movies. We, yeah. We've we've went went through a lot of, you know, the the dark and slow or the super the super supernaturals and and all of this. We've been through all of these things. We've seen it. We've grown up with it. We've loved it. And so we're kind of numb to a lot of it. So I have to remember that at one time, things like Psycho, and things like The Exorcist, 
And things like uh, Suspiria and Halloween were once called the scariest films ever made. Well, and I think and too, to me, watching Halloween now, I'm not scared at all. Like, how could anyone ever be scared of it? Because we've, we've gone so far and everything's been influenced by them. So it's not fair to say that anymore. But I, I cannot judge a horror movie by how much it scares me at this point. Because I'm just almost too numb. Well, I'm not saying that you couldn't say it's a good, scary movie based on how scared you were. It's possible to watch a movie that's not good at all and find yourself being scared. Mm. I think it's all, like, situational. I know that, like, if if I were to sit my 13-year-old nephew down to watch Suspiria, knowing some of the movies that he's already seen, I don't think that he would think that it's quite frightening at all. Yeah, and everything's so stylized. Even the gore is stylized. Right. And, and, and and things have been done so much more realistically. If you watch Seven, you, you watch down, you know, you sit down and watch Seven, you're like, ugh, right? It actually turns your stomach versus Suspiria, you don't feel that way because it's so obviously stylized and almost an art form in the way it's done. I mean, the heart, stabbing the heart, it was obviously like an open, perfectly symmetrical, you know, like hole where you can see the heart through it, oh, like an yeah. empty chamber. Well, it looked like a heart you that know. someone drew. Actually, it's like a Valentine heart yeah. a little bit. I was like, it doesn't look like an or Oregon, you know? Yeah, and I and I feel like there could have been a choice to make things hyper realistic, but that choice was not made, and I think that was made purposefully. I think it's going to happen in the remake, though. I think it's going to seem a lot more realistic. Yeah, I've heard I, things. I yeah. think that he's not. He's getting away from this like fever dream aspect and making it just like <laughs> yeah, Joe. like the more hyper realistic, like Kubricky kind of shining. Right, and it's going to be awesome. Didn't they say in the trailer for this movie, like, the only thing scarier than the last 12 minutes of this movie is the first 90? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just like, well, no. <laughs> and most importantly, Chris, who's the hottest guy in this movie? I don't even... Is there a hot guy? Uh, I guess there's a guy that's like a male ballet dancer. I thought he was family at first. I mean, there it must be family, but I guess there's a... Well, there were many... I mean, there were guys dancing. There were guys flouncing all around the yellow room and things like that. But there was that one guy specifically that came over to bring Susie's things at Olga's apartment. Mm -hmm. And Olga's on the phone and she's like, oh, I think he's flirting with you or whatever. I mean, he's cute. It kind of turned him into a half-assed love interest. And it just didn't work. I mean, it, well, it kind of kept you distracted a little bit. But, I mean, like, thinking something might happen. But he kind of just disappears by the end of the movie. Like, you don't know what happens. There's nothing happens there. And that's great because, I mean, like, Susie's a final girl. And she ain't need no man to, like, do nothing. But, I mean, other than him, all we got is, like, that psychiatrist who's constantly drinking wine out of some random glass and, like, his older, like, you know, friend. Well, when he was, when they were all sleeping in the, after the maggot thing, they all had to sleep in the auditorium or whatever, the dance hall. Right. And, of course, we find out that Helena Marcos is behind, you know, the, the partition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but also behind the partition is that cute guy, that cute uh, ballet dancer, right? Oh, yeah, because he's, like, peeking over the Yeah, he the goes over the edge. Just like, where is he? Is he, like, is mm. he, like, Snuggle Bunny over there with Helena Marcos? Probably. Like, just like his little, like, coven cutie. That's maybe, who that is. <laughs> maybe he was a spy the whole time. Mayhaps. I mean, he could have been. Actually, you know what? Now that I think about it, I think that Olga played a part in that, too. Because she's on the phone, and she's saying some random thing. She's like, hold on, I'll call you back when you know I think about it. You know she reminded me of? She remind. I thought she... For starters, I thought she was totally hands down in the coven. I could, I just like, I could have swore it. And she was so sly and kind of yes. like sarcastic and dry and dark. And I was just like, and like looking like she had emotives and stuff in the background and like really clever. And she actually kind of reminds me of the, uh, the goth chick from The Craft. <gasps> oh my God, you're right. What the hell was that character's name? It's Feruza Balk. Yeah, I know I that. Like, for, uh, why do I remember a name like Feruza Balk? <laughs> but I can't remember the character's name. She's very much like that. Because she was sitting there on the couch and Susie comes out and she's like, thanks for the room. And she's like, oh, I'm so glad you like it. And I was just like, she seems like a snake. Just like what she calls them when they're in the changing room. And she's like, the name of snakes. And I'm yeah. like, well, clearly... I mean, I always thought that she was part of it, too. Yeah. I think that phone conversation that was she was having was really her, like, selling Susie to them in some way whatsoever. It's also hard for me to, to imagine them as 12-year-olds, especially since Olga was supposed to have her own apartment, right? Right. Well, maybe that was a rewrite. Maybe. So he didn't rewrite anything when he did that? Theoretically, they said no. 
Uh, well, I mean, it's Europe, Maybe and they let children rich. grow up a little older and quicker, right? So, I mean, by 12 years old, you're already married and have your own business. Well, presumably your parents are putting you through all this and paying your tuition and everything else. The Tanz Dance Academy of Freiburg, Germany. Well, and we know that Susie's got family, too, because Madame Blanc is like, oh, I used to know a band yet. And she's like, oh, it's my aunt. She's like, oh, what a lovely person, in her, you know, old school overacting way. Yeah. Uh, my biggest takeaway from this movie, too... And if, if I achieve nothing else in life, someone has got to call me vice directress. <laughs> I mean, I really want to go to my job this Monday and just be, hey, I know I'm called supervisor, but can you just call me vice directress? Vice directress, Blanc. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> well, I think that we have just beat Suspiria dead. <laughs> Is this something that you would watch again? Yes, yes. Suspiria is definitely a film I'd watch again, and I would recommend to others who are interested, especially in the visual aesthetics of film. This is something for the record books. If you think that you're a horror fan and you have not seen Suspiria, you have got to go watch it. It's canon of horror films. It has influenced many people afterward, and you can see where he was influenced by the horror movies that came before him. It's just something that everyone has got to cross off their list and power through it. Power through it. <laughs> Keep it to your heart. I promise you, on subsequent viewings, you will love it more and more. Yes. I think that's it for this month, guys. I want you to join us next month. We'll be talking about the new Halloween classic film, Trick or Treat. I love this movie. Me too. I have a special place for anthology horror films, and it just burrowed its way in real quick. And it's such a Halloween film. It just looks... The whole thing just looks orange. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then... You know what? Let's just save all that for next time. We have bonus content. Bonus content! So we're actually going to release three episodes of bonus content to our Patreon page. One's going to be our top ten horror remakes. Another's going to be our ideas for sequels for Copycat. And the third is going to be our seal of approval for Best Horror Actress. You can find all this bonus content on patreon.com slash thefilmflamers. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter at The Film Flamers and join in the conversation. Tell us what you think about our episode, uh, what you think about Suspiria. Uh, you can also rate, review, and subscribe to us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, if you'd like to support us or get access to basically any of our content, including our store, just go to filmflamers.com. Or you can send us an email. What's our email address, Chris? Tiredqueens at filmflamers.com. We've been recording for a long time, and I am tired. I'm tired, too. Okay. Well, until next month, guys, sweet dreams. That sounded really gay. It's less gay. <laughs> <laughs>